Well, good morning. I tell you, I have already been blessed richly, benefited really beyond words, simply by sitting at the feet of these men and hearing these three previous lessons. Wade, I'm going on record just to tell you the whole pond, the rock and the pond of Scripture. I, I hope to use that as long as I preach the rest of my life. That's a great illustration. Let's talk about worship for a moment. Our theme for this weekend is different, not less. But truly, when many denominational visitors come to our assemblies, if we are blessed and fortunate enough to persuade them to come and to visit our assemblies, truly many of them must believe that we are missing out. That we are not merely different, but that we are actually less than so much that is offered in the modern religious world. Now, you and I know, and it's been clearly stated many, many times, that when an outsider comes to our assemblies, that almost immediately the first thing they notice that will be different about our worship will be the absence of mechanical instruments of music. And through the years, there have been jokes, there has been scoffing and derision uh, ranging from maybe uh, you poor people, you cannot even afford a piano or you, you don't have the money to buy an organ or something like that. Ranging from that to maybe, well, if you did have a piano or an organ, you wouldn't have anyone skilled or educated enough to know how to play one of those things. And so that attitude, though often perhaps uh, spoken in jest, it does uh, suggest the idea that we are missing out, that we are lacking something. You know, I, I've often preached on instrumental music through the years, and if the Lord continues to spare my life, I will continue to do so going forward. And I've pointed out that the reason that we do not have instrumental music in the Lord's church is certainly not a matter of finance. Uh, we, we, could, we could give and we could contribute and we could buy fine instruments to equip so-called, the uh, worship assemblies. That's not a matter of money. And, and that's something else, too, and, and I've just, I was struck with this this morning as I thought about it. Neither is it a matter of a distaste for music. Uh, this weekend, I am staying with the Wood family. And until 11 o'clock last night, they sat in their living room, many of them, and I got to sit there, and I didn't do a whole lot, but I listened and you know what we did till 11 o'clock last night? We played music. This past week, I held a gospel meeting in Mossy Head, Florida. And our meeting assemblies were in the Panhandle Opry building, a building owned by members of the church, a family that twice a month they put on a musical show there at the Panhandle Opry. They love music. And so it's not a matter of the lack of funds. It's not a matter of a distaste for music. Time and again, we find the Lord's people who love music. My own father, uh, as he lived, he loved music. He played music all of my life. But here's the point. Neither is it a matter of personal preference. Do you hear me? When it comes to the worship of Almighty God, it doesn't matter how much you love instrumental music. That matters not. It does not matter that your personal preference might be, well, let's augment. Let's uh, innovate with this worship service and let's make it more, right? More. Let's make it better. That's what we're talking about. No, that doesn't matter. It's not a matter of personal preference. Worship before the God of heaven has always been a matter of thus saith the Lord a matter of biblical authority. And because that is lacking, okay, uh, profoundly lacking in the New Testament, and not only in the New Testament, but it, it's conspicuously lacking the first six or seven hundred years of church history. No evidence, no authority whatsoever for the use of mechanical instruments of music in the assemblies of the Lord's people. So. We understand why people in the world might say that we have less, but we're not less. We're simply different. Now, this morning, I want you to begin with me in Hebrews 11. Open your Bibles with me to Hebrews 11, 4. Wade scared me a little bit as he was preaching that masterpiece of a sermon that 
we got to sit and hear a moment ago. He scared me when he went to uh, Abel in Hebrews 11, 4, but, but he didn't camp out there too long. Notice here the Bible says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now, I, I could reiterate what Wade had mentioned a moment ago about what does it mean to worship by faith. Biblically speaking in this context, worshiping by faith does not mean that you believe in what you're doing. I really believe that's what the, the average American probably thinks this means. Well, if you worship by faith, you, you believe in what you're doing. Denoting sincerity, de denoting good faith, so to speak. That's not the idea here. You know in Romans 10 and verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It is actually, it is actually impossible to do anything by faith if we're using biblical terminology and biblical definitions. It is impossible to do anything truly by faith if that action is not grounded and based upon the word of God. Because that's where faith comes from. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So we, we could replow those furrows and, and there's no need. I, I trust you understand that. But what I do want you to see a, a little bit differently from what was pointed out earlier. And not differently, but in addition to what was pointed out earlier. Is I want you to notice the biblical principle here. That the manner with which man approaches God in worship. It affects his standing before God. The Bible says here that by this more excellent sacrifice by which he, Abel, obtained witness, a, a, a statement, an attestation, if you will, a witness that he was what? This is a legal term. He's right with God. Now, there's only one person who can make that attestation. Only one person can make that declaration. He, he can look at Abel and say, Abel, you are right with me. And the only person who can make that declaration is not Abel. It's not Adam, his father. It's not Cliff Goodwin looking back thousands of years on this scenario. The only one who could look down at Abel and say, Abel, you are justified in my sight. Abel, you are right with me was God. And God is the one here who makes this testimony, this witness, that he was righteous. God looked down at Abel and the worship that he offered, now don't miss this. He looked down at Abel and the worship that he offered and in connection or in reaction to that, God says, you are right with me. Do you see how the manner in which we worship God, it directly, it directly affects our status or our standing with God. God testifying of His gifts. The Hebrews author goes on to tell us more specifically what is it that God saw. In Abel's worship, we know that it was by faith, yes, but God also testified of His gifts. He testified concerning that which Abel came offering him. And then the perennial, yea, perpetual lesson that will stand until the end of time comes at the end of verse 4. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. The example forevermore as long as this world stands is that when we come before God, we had better come before God by faith, which means we take God at his word, whatever God authorizes, whatever God commands, we take God at his word and we act, we respond accordingly. That is the best layman's definition I know of in the whole world concerning biblical faith. Someone comes up to me and if they want a one statement answer, Cliff, what is biblical faith? It is taking God at his word and acting accordingly time after time after time throughout scripture. 
And when it comes to worship, we see here proof positive that such directly affects our status, our standing, and our relationship with God. May I state that differently? We cannot, man cannot worship God improperly and be right with his God. Now that's how serious this is. Man cannot worship God improperly and be right with his God. Now, I could go on. I've spoken ten and a half minutes already. I could go on and I could spend the rest of the time addressing matters that I would hope and trust you've heard many, many times, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the balance of our time and I want to address something that I fear may be a pitfall for us, for you and me. When our denominational friends come to our assemblies and when they react to our worship assemblies, is there an area in which they might justifiably make the charge, Cliff, you people are not only different, but you people are less. Oh, I hope not. I hope not. But consider with me John 4 and verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him. And I want us to build off of these next two words, in spirit and in truth. The beloved late Brother Wendell Winkler has already been mentioned a time or so this morning. I love that man. I heard him preach a sermon on worship from this text on one occasion many, many years ago, and he pointed out that there is an aim in worship, God. There is the action of worship. Worship itself is a verb. There is the authority in worship, truth. It must be done in truth, once again, in accordance with God's word, John 17, 17. There is even the absolute in worship, must. God's worship is not Burger King religion. You can't just do it your way. It must be done in this manner, in spirit and in truth, so the absolute. But then that other A is the word attitude, in spirit. God forbid, may it never be said by any visitor to our assemblies, you folks have it right. You, you, have, you have the right actions and you have this and you have that. But you're not engaging your hearts. You might well be worshiping in truth per se. But you're not worshiping in spirit. Now what does this mean? First of all, I want you to know it has, I say absolutely nothing. It has absolutely nothing directly to do with the Holy Spirit. It's very unfortunate that some people read John 4, 24, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, and, and they jump. They, uh, the law of rationality that Brother Moser mentioned, they ignore the law of rationality, and without any evidence in the context whatsoever, they jump from worshiping God in spirit to the Holy Spirit, and then they get into all these fanciful, mystical ideas of what the Spirit supposedly does in our assemblies. No, that's not what it says. Let me tell you what it says. Use the way the word spirit is used the first time in the verse to understand how it is used the second time in the verse. God is a spirit, meaning God is a spirit being. Meaning, God is spiritual in his nature. Now what it means in the second occurrence, we must worship God in spirit. It means that we must engage our spirits, not the Holy Spirit. We must engage our spirit. It means that our worship must be spiritual in nature, just like God is a spirit being. Now we can state this more colloquially in a number of ways. It means that our worship must come from the heart. And let me tell you what. On Sunday mornings when we sit in the assembly and we sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And we're thinking about the barbecue later that afternoon. Or we sit and the bread, the unleavened bread is going through the aisles and then the fruit of the vine is passed through the aisles. And as we eat and drink of those emblems, we're thinking about our fishing trip tomorrow morning. Let me tell you this. I know that those people, our visitors, they can't see our hearts. And I understand that. 
But if they were to know the thoughts and the intents of our hearts, they could then make the charge. They could say, not only are you folks and your worship different, but your worship is less. Now, brethren, this is up to you and me. This is between the individual and God. But God forbid that be true in our lives. Or I know we're worshiping in truth. We, we have stressed that, and we have to stress that in this world. We have to. That's the world we live in. But we are negligent, and we shall be judged by God if we are not also worshiping in spirit. And so I want to lay out, I've now gone 15 minutes, I want to lay out something for you to think about tomorrow morning. Lord willing, I, I'll be assembling at Ironiton back home, but a number of you will be assembling here, and others of you will be assembling in various congregations. When you show up for the worship hour tomorrow morning, I want you to think about what you bring in your heart. And I want you to think about what you're going to maintain the focus concerning in your heart. And I'm going to distill that down for our intents and purposes here this morning into one word. Gratitude. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians. I don't know that there's another New Testament book in the entire New Testament canon that more prevalently emphasizes a theme of gratitude than does the book of Colossians. Now, I did not always know that. I found that, I discovered that back about five or six years ago when I began teaching Colossians for a GSOP class. But I want you, instead of walking you through this chapter by chapter, now we could do that. We could go through all four chapters in Colossians and we can find thankfulness, thanksgiving, or gratitude in all four chapters. But time won't permit me to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to skip that and I want to take you to the crescendo of gratitude in this epistle. If you're familiar with singing and with music, you know that crescendo is the high point. It's the pinnacle, the, perhaps the, the uh, voices and the volume of the, the worshipers, they ascend to their highest max at the crescendo. And I want you to look in Colossians chapter 3 at the Holy Spirit's crescendo concerning gratitude and thankfulness as it was penned by the Apostle Paul. Notice here in Colossians 3 and verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye circle it be ye thankful our membership in this right here our membership in the family our membership in the one body that Don mentioned the previous hour our membership should be great cause for unceasing thankfulness. Be ye thankful. Now, that kind of gratitude, how does it come out? Keep on reading verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The word and its influence, the word and its teachings, the word as it abides in our heart, dwelling in us richly in all wisdom. How does that come out? It comes out in the songs that we sing. <laughs> Wade says he finds himself quoting Brother Mosier. Wade, I've been doing that too. <laughs> Brother Mosier told us preacher boys, he says, boys, you can sing a lie just like you can tell a lie. Okay, so what's supposed to come out in our singing? The doctrines of men such as premillennialism, Calvinism, there are songs in your song books that teach that. So what comes out in our singing? Well, if we're doing Colossians 3.16, the Word comes out in the songs that we sing because the Word is what's dwelling in us richly. And from that storehouse of God's Word in our hearts, we teach and we admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, now here it is, circle it, singing with grace. And folks, we're obviously in the worship assembly in verse 16. Okay? We're talking about the body, the church, in verse 15. But it's obvious that we're in the worship assembly in verse 16 because the pronoun here requires reflexive action. 
one another. I can't, I can't do that by myself at home. Okay? For us to be teaching and admonishing, here it is, reciprocal action back and forth. For us to be teaching and admonishing one another. I know where the church is in verse 16. We're in the assembly. I know that it's an act of worship. We're singing. So, so I know what verse 16 is dealing with. This is a worship assembly of God's people and we are teaching and admonishing one another in congregational singing. But what I did not know for maybe 20 or 25 years in my preaching is I did not know what it meant to do this with grace in your heart. And I don't remember the genesis, I don't remember the source of this discovery, but it's always thrilling. Anytime you discover something new in your Bible study, man, that's always thrilling. And I can't wait, and I run it, and I can't wait to get up and tell everybody, look what I learned this week. Brother Moser told us in school, when you go to work, the church is basically paying you to study. As a local preacher, that's basically what's happening. You're getting paid to study the Word of God. <laughs> well, what a lie. And when we grow and as we discover and as we learn, we can't wait then to get up on Sunday mornings and to share, to impart to these brothers and sisters who are, who are paying our living so that we can study to get up and to share with them what we've learned. And so I don't remember the genesis, I don't remember the source of this, but somewhere along the way I realize that when a family sits down to offer thanks at the dinner table and one man turns to another man and he says, Son... Will you say grace? And the light came on. I know what it means to sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And if you want your worship to be different, and by the way, I want my worship to be different from the world. But if you don't want your worship to be less, you make sure tomorrow morning as you sing those psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, you make sure your heart is overflowing with gratitude. It's right there in verse 16. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Look at the next verse. We're not done. This is why it's the crescendo. He mentions it in 112. He mentions it in 2, 5 through 7. He mentions it in 4, 2. But right here in chapter 3 of Colossians, he mentions it in three verses back to back to back. This is the pinnacle of gratitude in the book of Colossians. And so we're not done. Verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed. Now isn't it interesting that this verse is coming off the heels of the verse that we know is talking about the worship assembly. I mean, you can't get around it. Verse 16 concerns the worship assembly, period. And right on in the next breath, the next stroke of the inspired pen, as it were, whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, you do all by the authority in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then he's not finished. What characterizes all of our worship? What characterizes all of our Christian living? What characterizes it? Giving thanks. giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. As I begin to close now, this is my conclusion, which means it could go two minutes or it could go ten. I don't really know. But as I begin to close, I want you to think about these three things to make sure, to make sure that our worship, though different, and thank God our worship is different, but to make sure our worship is not less than those who might be worshiping sincerely, though in error. Three things about gratitude. Number one, there is an acknowledgement. Very quickly, go with me to the book of Hebrews, very quickly. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, By Him, Jesus Christ, our great high priest, By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, once again, this, this would pertain not only to our singing, this could pertain as well to our praying. The fruit of our lips, and then the old King James reads, giving thanks to his name. And for years I, I thought, you know, that's just giving thanks, thanksgiving. 
And if it weren't taught here, it's taught in many other places, as we've already noticed. But you look at the Greek word, and this is homilageo. This is not really the word for giving thanks. I don't really know why it was translated thus. This is the word for confession. Making confession to his name. Homilageo means that if God says something, you say the same exact thing. God says you're a sinner. We confess our sins. We homilageo our sins. We say, God, I'm a sinner. I sin. If God says, I've given you every good and every perfect gift, we homilageo, we acknowledge that God gives us every good and every perfect gift. I want you to understand, number one, that gratitude grows out of this fundamental acknowledgement. When we show up in the worship assemblies on Sunday mornings, we are there acknowledging Mark chapter 5, Psalm 126, 1 Samuel 12 and 24. We're acknowledging that our God has done great things. He's done great things. And that's why we're here. Now it's good to be pitched well. It's good to hit the right notes. All of that's good. But please, by all means, when you sing your hymns of praise to God, let that gratitude be in your heart. Acknowledge that God has done great things. And that you and I sit here today as the beneficiaries of His great things. And you worship like that, and your worship will not be less than anyone else's on God's green earth. Because that is the heart of of worship. Number one, acknowledgement. Number two, gratitude as we express it. Gratitude is the idea of the emotional embrace of what God has done. I, I, I can acknowledge, I can acknowledge that God has done great things and not ever emotionally embrace that and appropriate that to myself and be thankful. So, so number two, after acknowledgement, you've got the personal, emotional acceptance of what God has done for you. And it's out of that emotion that you, you are grateful. That's what gratefulness is. Gratitude is an emotion of sorts. But you've got to internalize it. You've got to make it yours. You've got to accept that God did all this for me. And then number three, turn with me to Psalm 35. If I haven't missed it here. Psalm 35, and this is where we'll close. There's three things about gratitude. We've talked about the acknowledgement. We've talked about the personal, emotional acceptance. Now, number three, there's another stage in this, and we'll do this tomorrow morning. The praise aspect. Praise is an outgrowth of gratitude, but the difference is is praise is the point where my internal, personal, emotional gratitude becomes public so that other people have to know about it. And other people experience it. Look at Psalm 35 and verse 18. He says, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. The psalmist here, David, he says, I will give thee thanks and I won't be alone when I do it. People who say, well, I can worship God as well at home as I can in the assembly. They're either ignorant or they're dishonest. Our worship unto God is intended to be to where we feed off of each other. He says, I will give thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. That third stage of gratitude is where it becomes public and where others around us, we have visitors to our assemblies, it's inescapable. We, we have outsiders or unlearned people sitting in our midst, it, it's undeniable. That's when others see for themselves firsthand, they experience for themselves firsthand that truly God has made a difference in our lives and we're acknowledging it. We're thankful to God for it and we're praising God publicly and we're not ashamed who hears, who knows, who sees. God help us to make sure that our worship, though different, is never less.